Okay. Well, good morning and welcome to worship at 1045 on June 21st, 2020. Um, we welcome you to worship at Calvary Moravian. This morning, we are looking a little different, of course, um, in being here in this space. So, and move out of the way. Um, we enjoyed a 930 uh, outside worship service this morning, a little bit shorter than our normal worship, and um, with some time to both enjoy the music of the organ floating through the windows, and um, a time for prayer and uh, scripture and a message and so forth. And so we had a good crowd this morning um, out on our lawn, all distanced, and um, we were, were happy about that. I think that we'll, we'll reevaluate this and probably stick with this pattern for a little bit, uh, but we certainly will send a, an email out to you to, to tell you. Um, still going to work through some things before we transition back to an inside service. So I'm glad that you're with us this morning. If you're watching us live or a little bit later on Facebook or YouTube, um, welcome to Calvary Worship and thanks for being with us. And we are in, in possession of a new router at Calvary, so hopefully I am not going to freeze or do anything strange and you can all hear me okay. So far? Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, so we begin our worship this morning with me finding my bulletin. Hmm. Um, where did I put that? That's okay, I'm good. <laughs> if this changes dramatically, you let me know. Um, we again have our, our bulletin, um, that is, I can attach that to, does anybody need the bulletin? Just wave, wave your hand before I do that. Or shout, unmute your mind. Okay, I think we'll be okay. We'll be going through again our worship mostly on PowerPoint and following along. Um, but before I do so, just a couple of announcements. Again, like I said, we did have a, a good 930 service. I think we'll probably continue this pattern. Um, we do look to doing some form of communion on uh, July 5th. We're looking forward to um, we have ordered some prepackaged sealed wafers and communion cups, and um, those are a way that we can celebrate communion um, with each one being being sealed. So, looking forward to that as potentially an outside service. Um, but we will continue this Zoom pattern uh, through the summer and continue to record it. So please just you know use your um, your own precautions and join us whichever way you feel the most comfortable. Um, throughout the summer. So like all of life, we are just rolling with latest news and, and where we're at. So, But as we gather ourselves in worship this morning, um, we will be turning to our um, liturgy that is celebrating God's loving kindness. If you recall our psalms that we have heard through the month of June mention this one word, has said, uh, God's loving kindness. Over and over again, there's uh, numerous mentions of this Hebrew word throughout the Old Testament and of course plays out in the life of Jesus. And so this liturgy that's from a, a newer publication of the Moravian Church celebrates God's loving kindness and is the way that we're going to start off our worship this morning. So I'll be sharing the screen with you as we um, join in this worship. All right. Okay. So our liturgy to celebrate God's loving kindness. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me his marvelous loving kindness. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth.
Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. Yet we who are called to be God's people have fallen short of God's glory and have wandered from the paths that God has set before us. Therefore, let us confess our sins, trusting in God's mercy. Let's pause for a moment of silent confession. Amen. Hear what the Lord says. I am the Lord and the God who forgives your sins, and I do this because of who I am. I will not hold your sins against you. Go and sin no more. Having received God's gracious word of forgiveness, in the peace of God, let us profess our faith. I believe in God the Father who wills our salvation. I believe in God the Son who offered himself to us that our sins might be forgiven. I believe in God the Holy Spirit who gives us spiritual gifts that we may live our lives in Christ. Because of what God has done for us, we respond in faith and love and hope. Amen. I'm going to bring us back for a moment as we share in our, our prayers together. Um, so if there are prayers of, that you'd like to share, feel free to unmute, unmute yourself. And again, if you have the permission to, to share in those prayers for another, um, prayers for our community, prayers for our greater world, that we can be together in prayer. So are there any prayers that you'd like to share? Hey everyone, I just want to ask for prayers for our friend Jan and uh, her son Andrew. We had a memorial service yesterday for our friend Randy out uh, at Emmaus Community Park uh, with a nice gathering and beautiful weather and uh, his sister Connie gave a great eulogy. Um, it was a good time of remembrance, but Jan and uh, Andrew are they're still struggling with this and we need to pray for them keep them built up and uh, raise them up so uh, they can just adjust their lives and uh, move forward. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Jeff. I know that we've, we've offered prayers for Randy and both in his passing for his uh, extended family and for you as, and Fran as well. So we'll continue to hold you in our prayers. I'd like to have prayers for everyone as we go into a, the green phase that we stay safe and uh, people aren't foolish and do risky things so that the, the epidemic doesn't spread any further. Thank you. We were trying to practice this morning a little bit about being living in the present and being satisfied with where uh, we are at that that degree of patience that maybe is a good prayer for all of us to to be wise and um, respectful and patient, which is much easier said than done. But thank you. Any others? I did. We did have a prayer chain request, and um, Jean asked if I would share it again. Um, Jean Cutroff's sister on Friday was diagnosed as having lung cancer. So Jean um, is asking for prayers for Lorraine and all of her family as she faces this diagnosis um, and just in, in this, the days ahead. So we'll continue to think about Jean and Lorraine and, and her family. Okay. Well, again, we're... Grateful to see you all. Um, we come before God now with this word of prayer, and um, then we will continue uh, with some musical meditation. But let's come before God with prayer now. Loving God, we offer up to you the prayers that have been upon our lips this morning. Prayers 
for the family of Randy, for those who are grieving in this time, from losses that have, just like every loss, been difficult, but often associated with isolation or fear or unknown. We lift them up to you. We ask for your presence and patience and guidance as we move in this state towards um, this green phase and towards easing of restrictions, but also that we would continue to be wise um, and prudent and take each day without trying to go too much further into the future. Allow us to, to look out for each other in all that we do and say, Give us that degree of patience that we need in our own lives as well. Lord, we ask your prayers for those who are suffering from diagnoses. We ask that your peace and your presence might follow those um, who are traveling. And continue in your wisdom to bless us with the faith that we have to take uh, and to master the fears that are sometimes very real in our world but to know that we are called upon to be bearers of your kingdom, of your justice and your love uh, for all of your children. And so we pray this prayer that Jesus, our master and our Lord and our redeemer taught us saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now as we continue worship, we'll be sharing two songs. Um, these were both performed uh, this morning on organ by our organist, Anne, and I recorded them a little bit earlier. Um, one is faith of our fathers, and as our prayers are lifted up in gratitude to, to all of those who are fathers and who've acted like fathers uh, to us on this Father's Day. And the other is Come Thou Fount. So um, she's provided um, these two hymns into one longer song as a part of musical meditation for us this morning. I'll be sharing that with you.
Thank you, Anne. Uh, beautiful word, beautiful music to help us to reflect as we worship together. We'll hear now our scripture readings uh, from, and again, our, my thanks to David Vendetta for being able to read for us. David, if you would unmute yourself, unmute yourself and uh, mm -hmm. share with us our two readings for today. Yes, the first reading is from Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 to 21, to 22, I'm sorry. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman, whatever Sarah says to you. Do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. The second reading is from Matthew chapter 10, verses 24. To 33. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them. For nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven.
Thank you very much, David. We appreciate your reading this morning and sharing um, both in our Old Testament lesson and our gospel lesson. And those words of, of do not fear uh, come to us again in our next hymn, Be Still My Soul. Um, we'll listen, and if you choose to sing along, um, it is in our hymnal 757, Be Still My Soul. this morning from Genesis and from Matthew's gospel, and to begin with the, gospel, the, the Genesis passage, um, let's just establish a little bit of the background of, of what we heard. So we begin with the story of Hagar and Ishmael primarily as the focus, but before we get there, the lineage of the covenant promise is Abraham and Sarah. You might call them the uh, great forefather and foremother of the line of the Israelite heritage, of the covenant promise that God made. And if you call in the earlier chapters of Genesis, it was God who made uh, one of the first covenants promises with Abraham and said, Abraham, look up into the sky. Your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars. And Abraham is amazed and Sarah is amazed. However, they don't have a child. And Sarah begins to get sort of worried about this. And so the story goes that she takes her slave girl, her servant girl, Hagar, and she takes this woman and says, you should go to Abraham, have a child with him, and that will help us to have this lineage that God has promised. And so first, before we hear the story of Isaac, we hear the story of Abraham and Hagar. 
the servant woman of Sarah. Abraham and Hagar have a child and they name it Ishmael. And then some years later, Sarah is able to have a child and that is, of course, Isaac. That is the lineage that she has been hoped for and she has waited for. So the story comes to us today from the, the 21st chapter and it's two children in the story. It's the child of Abraham and Hagar, Ishmael, who is a little bit older and playing with the child of Abraham and Sarah, who is Isaac. And they're playing together. And Sarah's not too happy about this. Um, she's looking at these two children and she is wondering, well, which child is going to be the child that God chooses? Which child is going to be the one that is providing this covenant promise, the lineage, uh, the nation that God will choose? She is not happy that Ishmael and Hagar are in the picture. What we find out later is that Hagar has painted God into a much smaller box than God deserves, and that God isn't limited to such a choice between one or the other child, that God is bigger than this, bigger than Sarah's understanding of this, bigger than Sarah and Abraham's understanding of what the covenant means and who the covenant is for, and that the nation doesn't need to be limited to one lineage or one child, that God could do very well with blessing both. So the story unfolds that it seems like there's something about slight sight to talk about. There is Sarah's short-sightedness of God and God's ability to bless, and then there is the God who sees. And in chapter 16, when we first hear about Hagar, and Hagar realizes that God sees her, that God has chosen her too, and that God values her just as well as the other characters in the story, that Hagar replies to God and she says, Lord, you are Elvoy. And in Hebrew, Elvoy means the God who sees. El being God, Roy, the seen, the God who sees, she calls God. And so then after in, in chapter 21, where we hear, we're here today and we hear again, is this God going to see Hagar and Ishmael? Is God going to see them in their distress? They're cast off by Sarah. They are, they are banished into the wilderness, into the desert. And Hagar presumes that this might be the end, that she will die in the desert. But then she finds out that God not only sees her, but God also hears her. We hear first in verse uh, 16, God heard the voice of the boy, and then God who hears, God also sees and helps Hagar to see. She looks up and she notices that there is a source of water before them, a spring in the desert. She is led to the spring. She sees that there is a path, even in the midst of a horrible situation as a single mom in a desert without water, there is one step forward that she can take and she sees. So I wanna keep that story there for a minute because I think it's interesting that it's connected uh, to the gospel reading for today where we hear these words about fear. So what is Hagar told by God when she and Ishmael are out in the wilderness? When they presume that is all over, uh, that there is no step forward and that they are not the chosen people to be blessed or to continue on with life. God says to her words that come about in scripture numerous countless times, God says, do not be afraid. For God has heard the voice of the boy of Ishmael where he is. Do not be afraid, God says. Now fear would be something pretty natural to come to Hagar at this situation. She is alone with Ishmael, her child. She is in the desert without a source of water. She doesn't know about the path forward. And yet she is told, do not fear, take a step forward. God provides a path. God doesn't say that it's not gonna be hard for her moving forward, that she won't find some challenges just as Ishmael will, but to keep walking in one step forward, to master that fear in a way. Now for the disciples of Jesus in the passage that we heard from, from Matthew chapter 10, 
we're hearing about the calling of the disciples over the past few weeks, and we hear today, uh, what we didn't hear was a lot of, of warnings that Jesus is talking to those early disciples about. And Jesus is saying, when you go out there, know that it, it won't be easy all the time. You won't be welcomed. Sometimes you're going to have to make some really difficult decisions about things that you believe in, things that you stand for, and things that maybe even your family might stand for. He talks about persecutions as being a minority within um, the Roman state and all that they're going to be facing and will face as disciples, as proclaiming the good news, the kingdom of, of God. But he also tells them that while people can harm their bodies, what they cannot do is harm the spirit if the spirit comes from God. And he tells them those words, just like God said to Hagar in the wilderness, do not fear. Don't fear those who can kill the body, but can't kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy the soul and the body. So what is the, the counterpart to fear? How do we react to fear? What did Hagar have within her to see God and to ask and to be moving forward one step further into that wilderness? What do the disciples have within them to move forward, knowing that it wouldn't be always be easy, having those warnings of the persecutions and the things that they would face in front of them? Even as we said before, in their doubts that were mentioned in the gospel earlier, and now in these persecutions, what did they have? And I think the answer um, can be faith. What is faith? Now I'm getting this and I'm borrowing liberally from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King who wrote a wonderful sermon um, called Antidote to Fear. So how do we face the fears? What kind of antidote do we have when we have fears? And King in the beginning of his sermon has a wonderful illustration and he talks about how, you know, we're not, we're not telling folks to banish all their fears. So when God says, do not fear, it doesn't mean that there's not going to be fears in your life. And King says, and he uses this great example, that if you were in the jungle, you might be very natural, and it might be actually kind of healthy to have a fear of snakes. Um, sometimes fears can protect us uh, if they come within the proper settings, um, and they can protect us from, from some harms. But in Allentown, if you're here, in your bedroom and you are terrified of snakes in your bedroom, unless you're keeping snakes in your home, uh, that might be a paralyzing fear. That might be an unhealthy fear. And we need to find an antidote to that fear. And so he says, King goes on to say that, that normal fear protects and abnormal fear paralyzes. But what we are called to do is not eliminate or deny the fears that we have in life, but to master them. And so he writes how to master them with this element of faith. So he writes in his sermon and he preaches that religion endows us with the conviction that we are not alone in this vast and uncertain universe. Beneath and above the shifting sands of time, the uncertainties that darken our days and cloud our nights is a wise and a loving God that will carry us through. Not a wise and a loving God that will make our days without anything to fear, without any hardships, without any deserts or persecutions or injustices or challenging people or hurtful people, but with a wise and a loving God who will point out where the wellspring of water is, where the person is that will guide us to the next day, where the loving hand or heart or smile can be, where the beauty of nature is around us. God who will provide the faith as the antidote to fear. And so it is this God who sees. We begin with this God who sees and this God who hears both Abraham and Sarah and the lineage of their great nation of Isaac, and Hagar and Ishmael, and the lineage of their nation, a God that is bigger, and a God who sees and hears God's children. This faith, 
this faith taken in our life asked us to know the reality of a loving God that follows us, that is around us, and that guides us forward. But also a God that is bigger than just me and isn't put into my personal God box, um, but a God who also can be big enough to love and protect and to guide for, with those who maybe I find a little difficult or challenging or very different than me. It's this faith that allows us to respond as we sang and be still my soul in moments of uncertainty or change, in times when people are less than loving or fuses are shorter as we prayed for patience. Be still my soul, we respond and sing and pray to respond to moments of fear and change because we aren't called to just handle those situations alone. Be still my soul, we do it on the shoulders of our faith ancestors who have been carried by this wise and loving God into our future. So in King's sermon, Antidote to Fear, he concludes with these words, which are from an anonymous saying. He includes, fear knocked at the door, faith answered, and there was no one there. Question is how do we see this God? How do we see this God? Um, how do we hear those knocks at our door? And do we not ignore or close, but do we walk forward with this faith of God? I wasn't able to share all of this um, this morning because of time and just also uh, viewing restrictions, but I wanted to share just one example of um, what I saw as this God who sees. Um, there's a, an organization that the Eastern District of the Moravian Church has worked with in the past, and um, you may have heard of, we did an art show with them um, last year over in Bethlehem. It's an organization called Art for Justice, and it operates um, outside of Philadelphia, uh, wonderful artforjustice.org, very simple uh, website. And um, the website, the, the program was started uh, by a woman who had been visiting and teaching art in Greaterford Prison and was astounded by the, the artwork of um, the uh, prisoners and how much of a, a release it provided for them um, to display emotions and feelings in art and how much it could help us to understand not, not denying crimes or, or um, guilty or innocence, but to understand humanity of um, these individuals. Um, Anne-Marie Kirk is the founder's name and she's worked with numerous people, um, some who have been uh, freed because of, of uh, false charges, but others who are simply in prison uh, for the crimes they committed, but also sharing uh, their art. So one of the prisoners uh, that she had been highlighting was a man named Angel Artis. And um, as an artist, I was just captivated when I was reading Hagar's story about the God who sees and um, what Mr. Ortiz shared in his recent art. And I just wanted to share this with you all briefly and just to hear his words and his reflections. So this is a painting um, that he did. Of, he's very modern in his take, um, but again, captivated by this understanding of sight and of seeing another, um, of being present and being able to see both in the sense of a God who sees and all, also what we are called upon um, to see each other and maybe a way to handle uh, fear. And so Mr. Ortiz was writing about how the, the COVID um, pandemic has been affecting him in prison and his story. And that's all found on, on the website of artforjustice.org. Um, but he writes just about the sense of peace that he has found in a time when there should be no peace for, for what he has been experiencing and others um, in a time of, of high anxiety, of isolation, uh, of course, because of, of COVID. He says, I've never found so much peace. If I had known of this spiritual anointment in the past, it would have been my only high. Our lives, he, writes, he goes on, have been altered and changed but we will prevail. God has given us the grace to adapt. Be brave, 
help others, help ourselves, and trust in God's mercy and grace. We are in a storm that will pass, and we will get through this together. And the beautiful essay that he writes a little bit more, he tells his story, which I don't have time to get into, um, but again, it's ability of sight and of God who sees and of us who are able to see as a way to bring us um, through these times of trouble and times of fear. Amen. And I wanted wanted to share these prayers. Um, and again, as we've been focusing on the Psalms of God's steadfast love, uh, the selected verses from two of the Psalms for this week remind us um, of the scripture passages that we've heard and the prayers uh, that we offer to God. So we pray these selected verses from Psalm 69 and from Psalm 86 together. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. For you, O O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer, and listen to the cry of supplication. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Turn to me and be gracious unto me. Give me your strength to your, give your strength to your servant. Save the child of your serving girl. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame because you, Lord, has helped me and comforted me. More in numbers than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Many are those who would destroy me, my enemies who accuse me falsely. What I did not steal must I now restore. O God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me. Answer me, O God, for your steadfast love is good. According to your steadfast mercy, turn to me. Amen. And our last hymn for today is hymn number 603. This is, O Jesus, I have promised. Um, We will be singing verses 1, 3, and 4. Oh, Jesus, I have promised.
As we've come together, we hear these words again. May they guide us into this week. When fear knocked at the door, faith answered, and there was no one there. So may you go out knowing this faith that will allow us to come before the fears of life, the anxieties and the concerns. Go forward with the faith of our Lord, the love of our Redeemer, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who is God forevermore. Amen.